If they are not against us, they are for us. How the body of Christ remains whole. This past week, on Friday, actually, I was able to go to New York City for the first ordinary at Mass. Uh, it was in the occasion of our, the Feast of Our Lady of Walsingham. It was at a beautiful church in Manhattan, St. Vincent Ferrer, Gothic church in the Upper East Side. And so some of you may not know that I'm actually originally from New York City, and it was just so good to be back there on the streets. They're just so full of people. Every, wherever you go, every sidewalk is every walk of life right there. But what I didn't expect to see as I walked a considerable amount of those streets uh, this past weekend was how many dogs there were in New York City. Now, something about dogs uh, came to mind, and it applies, it gives an illustration to serve our gospel passage today. But thinking of dogs, do you admire purebred dogs? I mean, they're the ones that even if you don't know what breed they are, you can usually spot them because they are, are so consistent in, in how they look, and they have a balance to them. And so it's great to have a purebred dog, except when you talk to those who have them, you find how many of them have hip problems, or how many of them have personality problems. You see, when you limit the genetic diversity, problems tend to multiply. Well, we'll see how this applies to our gospel in just a moment, but let's, let's first prepare our hearts in a brief word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your word to us. Open our eyes to wonderful things in your word so that we might walk in your wisdom, know you, and make you known. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I just gave this illustration about dogs and how if you limit the genetic diversity, you, you might have problems. But that's, that's for dogs. For people, though, we know that there are some benefits to limiting outside influence. I tend to admire closely held family companies. What a great way to be able to bring forward a family identity with a particular, particular vision and to have that provision that goes along with that. Except if you talk to somebody who's been part of one of those family-owned companies, that tends to be all you talk about at the dinner table and at holidays <laughs> because all the problems are in your lap. So there's a human desire to protect in order to maintain identity and standards, whether that's dog breeds or your organization. The desire is so strong that we often can't see when it's gone too far. And it was the same for Joshua, if you think of our Old Testament reading, where Moses and Joshua and the elders were set apart to receive the Spirit of God. And then the Spirit came upon Eldad and Medad, but they were out with the people in the camp. What did Joshua say? He said, forbid them. But Moses' response was, would that all the people had the Spirit of God. Joshua was a man of faith, and he was referring to a very legitimate separation. But what Moses is saying is that we don't want to limit that too much. There are other gifts outside. And it's very similar with our gospel reading today in the disciples. What's old is new. The disciples said, Teacher, we saw a man casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him. The same words as Joshua. Because he was not following us. There seems to be a clear connection between these two passages. And so here they weren't separated from the people in such a formal way, the way Moses was with his elders. But it seems like the disciples wanted to create a very similar inner circle to which Jesus gave a similar correction as Moses. He said, do not forbid them. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is for us. So the message today seems clear. God can work through people who are outside of what we conceive to be our inner circle with the Lord. So we can be open 
to those gifts. If it were only so simple. I mean, it's good to have genetic diversity for your dog breed, but if there are no limits, then what do you get but a bunch of mismatched mutts? You lose the good qualities. Same thing with a family company. If you have too much influence from the outside, you're going to lose that special character that made that company so successful. And here we are in a heterodox society that pushes diversity to the level of a creed. And there's pressure to accommodate and water things down. So in order to push back, no wonder we're inclined to create walls, much like the disciples did. But let's think about how we often do this. This often in the way we speak or in the way we think. How we're so quick to disdain those who are different from us or not to uh, receive things from those to which we don't have so much commonality. We're not willing to receive their gifts. And this comes about not just from a desire to protect the church more generally, but often a desire to protect our corner of the church or, or my conception of the church or the way I think it should be when someone differs from me online. So what happens, here's the problem is that excluding others can often make it so that you and I are less critical of ourselves. And so what Jesus is saying in this passage is that not only do we need to receive healthy elements from the outside, but we need to make sure that we are pure too. So he continues, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life main than with two hands to go to hell. Now, it almost seems like we have two different passages here. One passage where, he's, where Jesus is saying, those who are not against us are for us. And it's almost like he's shifted his focus when he talks about uh, be careful lest you sin. But he's saying that there's a dual dynamic here. We want to bring in the good while, uh, from the outside while purifying ourselves from the inside as well. How do we do both at the same time? Now, wouldn't it be great if you could manufacture a filter that could at the same time keep out what is good from the outside and and let everything that's bad from the inside pass through the other way. I was shopping for a raincoat uh, some months ago and I found that North Face has a fabric that is intelligent enough to keep the, intelligent, I mean it's been made such a way that the, the moisture does not come inside, but at the same time is able to let the moisture come out. But that's with just one element. As that, this doesn't, that analogy can't apply to us right now because we have so many different uh, viewpoints out there, so many different types of people who are claiming Christ in different ways. Where, where is the good? Where is the bad? So many different ways in which impurities can come from us. Uh, thousands of factors to evaluate. So there's no filter like that that can be manufactured. No analogy for that. But there is a filter like that that exists, and that is the body. The body is amazingly efficient at able to filter out impurities and to be able to, to take the nutrition from the outside while getting rid of what is not helpful to us. And so it is that if we are going to be effective at evaluating what's on the outside and being able to, to cleanse us from the inside, we need to be more fully members of the body of Christ, the living body. This is an active process. You can't just turn off and expect that you're just going to have some standards and some, some fixed standards that are going to apply. You need to be in relationship and, and evaluating through the Spirit of God, even as that Spirit was received by Eldad and Medad. And so you might just say, all right, I get it. We're, we're called to, to think good thoughts, expel the bad thoughts, uh, 
do the good, do the good things, stop doing the bad things. But again, if it were only so simple. Because the problem is we often have error, uh, wrong ways of thinking that are so subtle we don't recognize them. And that's why we have the filter of God's Word, His living Word, which has kept the church safe throughout the ages while enabling the church to grow. And in this way, we have error comes in ways that are often very, very subtle. And so you think of the, the most famous heresy, uh, Arianism. And we might apply this to the need to keep the body pure. Was Arius inside the body or was he outside the body? It's actually a little bit hard to say. You, you can view him in, in, in either way. But he, he called upon the name of Christ, but he denied his divinity in, in very subtle ways. But you had, uh, you had St. Nicholas, and what was his response at the famous council? He struck Arius because he took very seriously that if anyone were to cause one of these little ones to sin, it'd be better that if he were cast in the sea with a millstone around his neck. In such a way, the, the theologians, uh, Athanasius, and these heroes of the faith were willing to say, look, we take, we take error very seriously because it can kill. It can cause changes in thinking that cause people to sin. And in some ways, this is very subtle in terms of an imbalance of how we understand God's, things like God's, uh, his majesty, uh, his, his, the way he's beyond us, as well as in his imminence, the way he dwells in us. You get this imbalance, and we can, we can embrace pleasures uh, without regard to spiritual checks. Or we can reject the world in a spiritual way that ends up moving towards Gnosticism. And so it's kind of like this. If you take in waters, water might have the wrong pH balance for your body. But your body has a wonderful way to be able to restore that pH balance. Uh, to restore the sense of the transcendence of God as well as the imminence of God if we understand, if we're connected to that living body, the church, which is formed by God's Word. But here's the problem, is that so often throughout church histories we have manufactured filters in the form of philosophies. Arius, much of, much of what drove him wrong was his desire to protect what he understood to be the transcendence of God. God is wholly other. If God is wholly other, then he can't come and take the form of a man like our Lord. And so philosophy, if we have philosophy as a cover to God's word, if we start with that, then it won't work in the same way as the living, as the living vibrant word of God. I don't have time to get into this, but there are many good theologians who have made the same error. And so we need to trust into, in the church uh, throughout time to correct these things through the wholeness of the body. Whenever you have separations, we tend to go wrong. But as this word becomes a filter for us, it's natural because we are embraced the logos, the one who created the world from which all things come. Now, as we understand this, we understand that what happened to the Word, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became a living body. And when that happened, all things changed in terms of mission, in terms of what it means to protect God's people. Think of the Old Testament. Some of you might remember we had a, a whole homily based on this some weeks ago, but in the Old Testament, when you had something holy and something unclean touched it, the holy thing was defiled. That's why you had to protect the temple, put walls around it, and limit access to it in a very radical way. But then what does our Lord Jesus Christ do with his living body? He is holy. When he touches the unclean, it becomes holy. So when we have walls around ourselves, like the disciples, this is out of fear. We're having that old mentality that if we touch something unclean, it will defile us. But if we are fully incorporated in the body of Christ, there is no fear. We can step out boldly in mission because with God's word, as his living body, with his living word, we are able to transform the world 
in mission. And so this is, enables us to go out and reach those who, ha, who are marginalized. What was the problem with the disciples? They forgot their own origins. Uh, think of, uh, it was John who was quoted in our gospel passage today, but remember Matthew, who was a tax collector, and the Pharisees tried to reject him. He doesn't belong in our inner, inner circle. To whom Jesus said, go and see what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is what God's living word brings forward. Mercy to the outside and a severe mercy on the inside to purge what's unclean on the inside so that we can be fully the body of Christ. So it bears to have this reminder that Paul gave to the Corinthians. For consider your calling. Brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And so it is that we are like Eldad and Medad who have been incorporated into the body of Christ. And so we can find others like that. God goes forward and, and, and grows his inner circle by going forth. So you might think of it this way. The body of Christ is not so much as, as, a, as a group behind walls, but more like Robin Hood who collected his merry men. Not just anyone could join Robin Hood's band of merry men, but, but once they did, they were transformed by that ethos. And if anyone were not loyal to Robin Hood, they would be cast out. Otherwise, there's no surviving in those woods under that evil King John. And so it is as we go forward in the church. But God one-ups our expectations in this way. For if you remember in that Old Testament reading, Eldad and Medad were outside of that inner circle of Moses, and they were in the camp with the people. Where does our Lord Jesus Christ go? Let's look at it from Hebrews 13. This is key. So Jesus suffered outside the camp. Yes, Eldad and Medad were in the camp. Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing abuse for him. So it is our Lord Jesus Christ came to bear the reproach that you and I have had. You and I have been outside the camp in our own sin, and he did not leave you out there when you were wrong thinking, when you were claiming Christ in your own hypocrisy. He was willing to draw you back to the body. And so without fear in the fullness of Christ, with that compassion, with that mercy, we can go out and do the same. And so what happens here as we gather as the people of God? We go to Jesus at the altar who comes down to us. And we go to him on the cross, which is outside the camp. And so he creates his inner circle there. And as we become holy, incorporated into that living body and formed by his living word, and then we are sent out of here in mission to be able to reach those who do not know him fully. In this way, we don't have fear. Yes, we can go forward as, as, as purebred, so to speak, as we can go forward like a closely held family business, but yet bringing others to embrace those qualities fully as well, without accommodating, without watering down, without being f infected by the creed of heterodoxy. So let us proclaim the creed that we've been given in just a few moments as we stand forward as the body of Christ.